female warriors out there today. I want to acknowledge you, not just tomorrow, but let's do it today as well. Uh, I'm glad we acknowledged uh, Terry today for her 90th. She has been muchly blessed. Uh, Terry, you don't have a microphone, so you just have to use your fingers. Are you a mother? Yes or no? Yes. A mother of how many? Female warrior right there. Um, was going to mention this a little later on, but I thought I might bring it up now. Uh, we lost one of our female warriors in the early hours of this morning. Some of you may know um, Mrs Clifford, uh, Carolyn Clifford. She passed away today, uh, being rocked to sleep by her saviour till morning. Um, Natalie, thank you for your children's story, my God. <laughs> Kelvin's like, yeah, there'll be people pre uh, praying for you out back today. I just need prayers just to get through today. I want to acknowledge our female warriors. And for those of you who are regulars here, you will know uh, that we have been going through the Bible in a year. These are the texts that we have been looking at. And thank goodness we've got some female warriors that we get to focus on today. Kids, uh, you, for your sermon search, you're looking for these three words. Uh, we're going to be looking at the story of Hannah, we're going to be looking at the story of Naomi, and every time that Pastor D says mum or mother or mummy or any of those sorts of words, you can write that one down as well. If you have your Bibles, I'd love you to turn to 1 Samuel, where we look at the first of our female warriors that we want to focus on today. We don't have time to go through the stories. Some of you have grown up with the stories, so know them well. If you don't know the stories well, there's always time this afternoon to go back over the stories. But for this one, I want to focus on the story of Hannah, beginning verse 7. So there is a bit of a story to it. You've got... Um, a man who thought it might be a good idea to have more than one wife and uh, found out it wasn't such a good idea because he did have favourites. You shouldn't do that as a guy, but he did. He had favourites and he would reward Hannah over uh, Perennia uh, when it came to all the sorts of sacrifices and the eating and the celebrating. And that didn't go down well uh, with Miss P, and so she would dig it in every time. In verse 7 it says, This went on for year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you always so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? I have some very good friends of mine who have been trying to fall pregnant for quite some time. And in other conversations that I've had with visits, I find that falling pregnant is actually the miracle rather than the other way around. The struggle that some women have when all they want is, a, is to have a child to love and whether they don't find a partner or find the wrong partner or whether they're, they're just infertile the amount of turmoil that goes through, the amount of emotions that goes through, the miracle is in the fact that we have babies at all. And here Hannah is struggling. 
there's so-and-so sitting over there rubbing it in that she's a mama and I'm not. It's at times like these that the question could be asked, where is God? Thankfully, the story goes well. In verse 13, Hannah was praying in all her heart and her lips were moving and her voice was not heard. And Eli thought that she was drunk and he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Now, I don't know what tone of voice was used in that. Let's hope that he was kind. But if ever Pastor D tries to speak life into you and it's not appropriate, then you push back like Hannah did. She goes, how dare you, not so, my Lord. You don't have to call me my Lord, just how dare you. <laughs> I am a woman, I am a female warrior who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant to be wicked. I've been praying here out of great anguish and grief. And so Pastor Eli answered, then, my female warrior, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. We have a small minority of people in this church who understand the anguish and grief that Hannah was going through. I mentioned that I have friends who for years have wanted nothing more than to be a mum or a dad. Today we're going to have a kind of, not interactive in that you're talking, but it's not going to be just Pastor D talking all the time. There's going to be moments where we put things on um, pause and we're going to actually think of people in our lives that can relate to some of these stories that we are going through, whether it's with Hannah or whether it's through Naomi. So for the next 30 seconds, I want silence as we either think of names that we know in our lives, in our network, in our circle of friends, or if there's no specifics that we can think of, then be general and pray for the ladies who feel this every day. 30 seconds, quiet, your time starts now. So be it. So then it's just a page earlier for me, Book of Ruth. I want to look at the first chapter of Ruth. And oftentimes when we read this book, the focus is on the main character being Ruth. But today I want to focus on the mother-in-law, Naomi. In the very first verse of the first chapter, it reads, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. It's important that it mentions here that it's during the days when the judges ruled. I don't know if you remember from your Bible reading, but if you were to flick for me, again, just the one page back at the end of the book of Judges, this is how the book of Judges finishes. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. So it was during these days where there was no spiritual leadership or guidance that there was a famine across the whole of Israel. And it was getting so bad that Naomi and her husband and the two boys decided that it would be better 
to leave the house of Israel and go to that place called Moab where those people called the Moabites who were despised, we would rather go and join their community and live with them than stay in this famine land. Now, don't read into this because it could be presumptuous. But there's other parts in scripture where God sends a famine because it's the only way to get people's attention. Elijah's a good example. Unless something happens, you people are going to sit on your hands and do nothing. Let me send a famine because we need to get things moving. This could be another one of those examples. God going, I need my purposes carried out. You people are sitting on your hands. Let's have a famine. Let's get moving. Let's do what needs to be done. Stop doing the things that you want to do just as you see fit. Verse 2. The man's name was Elimelech. The wife's name was Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Marlon and Killian. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left there with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Killian also died. And Naomi was left with her, her, without her two sons and her husband. I wish I'd done a slide to go through the themes that are in the book of Ruth. I found really helpful that one that Poroshka showed, I think it was just last week, on how Psalms is designed. That was really helpful for me. But when it comes to the book of Ruth, I want you to look for these themes. First up, tragedy. Secondly, irony. Third, commitment. Fourth, despair. Fifth, hope. And in just these first six or five verses, you have the section of tragedy. Not only did they have to leave their home. That's a tragedy. Not only were their people suffering through famine, that's a tragedy. But Naomi lost her husband. That's a tragedy that some of us in this room have experienced. Not only did she lose her husband, but within a space of a decade, she lost both her boys. That is a tragedy. Both her boys had married Moabite women. That was a tragedy. It's going all so, so wrong. This was never the script that Naomi expected when she wanted to be a follower of God. And so again, you get to a pivot point where you can say or question, where is God? There's something unnatural, or at least from our perspective. There is something unnatural for a parent to bury their children. And for some of us in this room, that's what we're going through. So for the next minute, I want you to think of people either specifically or if not in general, who have lost their children. Or, there are many of us in this room who have lost our mothers. And for some of us, quite recently. So for the next minute, whether it's specific or general, let's be quiet and let's pray for these people.
So be it. And God, just want to remember the family of Carolyn who passed away last night. I ask that you be with her two daughters and the partners and the family and friends that are affected. Amen. So that's the part with the tragedy. Starting from verse 6 and going through to verse 14, this section is about the irony of the situation. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. So she finds out that now it's better off going back to home than staying in Moab. Yeah. With her two daughters-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and she set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi stops and she says to her, to her two daughter-in-laws, I want you to both go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord, Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye and they were weeping and, and said to her, we want to go back with you. You're our real mum. We want to go back to your people. But Naomi said, no, no, return home, my daughters. Why would you want to come with me? Am I going to have more sons who can become your husbands? Go, return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I could have another kid, are you going to hang around for them to grow up so that you can marry them? Ill. Would you wait until they... Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. And then Orpah decided to go home and kissed her mother goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Here's where the irony is. Naomi's now wanting to go back to her people. She tells her daughters-in-law that they are should go back for their own sakes to go to their real mums. They're weeping, they're saying goodbye, the girls are like, no, we want to go with you, we don't want to go back. Orpah leaves, but Ruth cleaves. Naomi says, what I can give to you, Ruth, it's not what I can give to you, Ruth, but what God can give. For some of us in this room, Tomorrow being Mother's Day, we don't even get to see our kids. They might be busy doing their own things in their own lives. They might be overseas. They might be too ill to come and see. There's a whole gazillion reasons why it could be. But it's not to say it doesn't hurt. And some of us in this room, tomorrow rather than being a day of joy, could be a day of loneliness and heartache. If you have people in your life or you are suffering in that area, I want us to dedicate the next 30 seconds in prayer for you. Let's do that. So be it. The next section from verses 16 through to 18 is the period of commitment. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Why don't you go back with her? But Ruth replies what often is uh, quoted in weddings rather than this context. Don't you urge me, girlfriend, to leave you or to turn back from you. 
Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if death separates you and me. And when Naomi realised that Ruth was a female warrior and determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. This is not just a commitment. This is a covenant being made. Ruth is making a covenant to her mother-in-law that no matter what, I will stick by you. And may the Lord deal ever so harshly with me if I break that commitment, if I break that covenant. That's how much it means to me. She is basically saying in these texts, when I die, I want the phone call going back home to say, hey, we're sorry to inform you that your daughter has died. You need to come. No, she, oh, I've messed that up. She, Ruth is saying, I would rather that the phone call go back to mum and say, your daughter has died, you need to come and pay respects, rather than your daughter has died, you need to come and collect her and take her home and be buried. That is a significant covenant being made between these two women. The next section, despair, verses 19 through to 21. So the two women went on their way until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in that place, the whole town was stirred because of them. <laughs> you know what that means, eh? They're all gossiping, they're all stirring. Oh, Naomi's come back and she brought in a Moabite woman. Da, 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 da. Not that we experience that in church life at all, but you know, it happens. And the women, not the men, because men don't gossip, the women are exclaiming, can this possibly be Naomi? And Naomi says in verse 20, do not call me by my name. Do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. I want you to start calling me Maya, which means bitter. I want to change my name by depot because of what I've been going through in my life. I went away full, but I have returned back empty. Have you ever felt like that before? Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. This theology is hard for me to grasp. But it's not the only place you find this kind of talk. Job, one of the best stories of showing what affliction is really all about. In the book of Job, he gets to a point where he says, Naked I came from my mama's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and it's the Lord that also takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. We, many of us, have a theology that when things are going good, God is blessing. When things are going rubbish, oh, that's just bad luck. Here Naomi says, it is God that has given, it is God that has taken away. I feel afflicted. Don't call me by that name no more. I now want to be known as Maya. Thank goodness by the end of chapter 4, and in generations and generations past, Pastor D gets up on the, on the pulpit and calls her by the name of Naomi. We'll find out why. But for now, in this present time, Naomi is saying, I left this place feeling full and now I'm coming back empty. There is something deeper going on. And then the first chapter finishes with hope. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. 
as the barley harvest was beginning. There's new shoots shooting through. There's new growth coming. There's change in the air. Something could go right for a while. Many of you may already know how the story goes. That love story of how Boaz and Ruth got together, la da yada yada yada. If you're not aware of it, take time this afternoon. It's just a short book. It took me less than 20 minutes to read through. Read the story. Here's the thing. Not only is it acclaimed by Bible scholars as being a really good piece of literature, but secular people are saying that is a good piece of literature. The themes that run through, the characterization, the plot, all oh, God, they say oh, it's a really good book. So don't just take it from a pastor going, ah, oh, go and read your Bible a bit more. Read it as a book. But it's more than just a love story between Ruth and Boaz. And here's the key, here's where I want to get to. Naomi at this point, apart from verse 22 where she feels the despair, at that point in life she's going, all has been lost. But all was not lost. All was not lost. Because I'll give you the cheats version. When you go to the end of the story in Ruth chapter 4, you read from verse 13, Boaz took Ruth, took Ruth and she became his wife. And they did those things that two people do when they love each other, just in case we've got a small audience, and enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. And the women said to Naomi, Praise be the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian or a redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life, Grandma, and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. And then Naomi took up the child in her arms and cared for him. It's one thing to acknowledge our female warriors here today as mothers, but may we also acknowledge our female warriors who are grandmothers amongst us today. Generations past. It's one thing for you to be the mother of your child, but to see your child grow up and then to go through the same process as what you did with her, Karma can be fun sometimes, but that's not where I'm going with this. To see your daughter, to see your son rocking, love you always, love you, like you forever, la da la, however it goes, Natalie. <laughs> There's some of us here this morning that need to be acknowledged for not only being female warriors in bringing up your own kids, but being warriors for your grandkids, for that next generation coming through. And so whether you can think of people specifically or whether you've got to think general, for the next 30 seconds, I want you to hold them and uplift them in prayer. Go. So be it. And so starts the most boring part of the book. For some reason it wants to end on a low note and just goes through a genealogy. So not only was it this generation that, you know, Naomi and Ruth, but then Obed and then na 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 
But look a bit closer, people. Where does it finish? This genealogy finishes with King David. The spiritual ruler and leader that the people were looking for in those days of the judges. Sometimes we're so focused on what's going on in our personal lives, the micro stuff, that we don't take the time or do not have the ability to look at the macro stuff. God says, I have a purpose. I need a King David. In fact, I need a King David in order to get a king and a saviour called Jesus Christ further on. And if you go to the New Testament genealogy, it starts off from where this place ends and keeps on going to show you where Jesus Christ, our Saviour, came from. It came from this family. Now, what would have happened if there was not a famine in that land? What would have happened if her husband hadn't died? What would have happened if her boys hadn't died? What happened if her boys hadn't married Moabite women? What if both the sisters said to the mother-in-law, you know what, I'm going back to worship my own people and worship my own gods. What would have happened to yours and my life had Naomi not gone through what she went through? Our God is a God of providence. And while I struggle with the theology, because it hurts sometimes, God's just as important, I mean, just as interested in what happens with the macro as what happens in the micro. God's providence and accomplishments does not depend on what you and I see. God's accomplishments or his providence does not depend on what you are doing. God's providence and his accomplishments does not happen and does not depend on what you do with your time. It's based on God's timing and based on God's purpose. And it may the Lord of the name of the Lord be praised. So wherever you find yourself in your life, when it comes to the female warriors in your life, tomorrow is about honouring them for all those tears and heartbreak, for all those difficult times and hard conversations. We use this time to honour our mothers. Enjoy tomorrow and may we honour our female warriors. There are many of us sitting here today and I'm going to ask a group of young people to go and get some special flowers and they're going to come around and honour you by giving you a flower if you fit in any of those descriptions that we mentioned today. You may be someone who desperately wants to be a mum and is not yet a mum. If that's you, don't feel shamed by not taking flour. If you want to take that flour and push it in the face of the priest Eli, you go for it. Because the moment that uh, Hannah made that dedication, she left and it says that her face was not downcast. God blessed her from that moment on where she said, this is the way it's going to be. For our mums who have lost children, for those of us who have lost mothers, for those of us who are grandmothers, if you wish to take a flower, take a flower, and we honour you while the music plays on the video. Father God, we want to acknowledge you today. We want to honour you for who you are. But also too, Lord, today we want to honour our mothers and our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers for all that they do to contribute to society. I thank you so much for the stories of Hannah, the stories of Naomi and of other women found in the Bible who were true female warriors who 
made a real impact. And in particular, God, I was moved by the story of Naomi that despite what was going on in her life and the heartaches and the hardships, it was through that that you created your purpose. God, many of us in this room are struggling with um, how it is that you are working your purpose through our lives. But I just want to give you gratitude for no matter what is going on, that we too can speak the words of Job and Naomi and say, no matter what is going well or what is not, may the name of the Lord be blessed. We give you gratitude today, God, in your name. Amen.